Coming up, a First Nations woman talks about the decision to give the Pope a headdress. And star of Reservation Dogs, Paulina Alexis, talks about the next season. Plus, we're introducing the newest team member of the Association on American Indian Affairs. I'm Mackenzie Allen Charmley, filling in for Leah Chavez. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from the ICT Newscast. This program is made possible in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. ASU offers the only online undergraduate digital media literacy degree, teaching students how to recognize and combat inaccuracies on all platforms. They are using cutting-edge tools and tactics to separate fact from fiction in a digital world overloaded with misinformation. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. This is the ICT Newscast with Aliyah Chavez. Thank you for joining us. Aliyah Chavez is away this week. We begin in Washington, D.C., where tribal leaders are testifying on the Indian Health Service Advanced Appropriations Act. The bill increases tribal and federal government efficiency, reduces federal taxpayer waste, and saves American Indian and Alaska Native lives. In 2018, a Government Accountability Office report noted government shutdowns had negative financial effects on tribal health care. This report also shows the chronic challenges Indian Health Services face, which was made worse by the pandemic. The Navajo Nation's more than 400,000 tribal citizens were hit hard by the COVID-19 pandemic. Navajo Nation President Jonathan Nez testified before the United States House of Representatives Natural Resources Committee. Nez stated that the bill addresses health injustices and ensures the health and wellness of tribal communities. Staying in the nation's capital, tribal nations are divided over the status of freedmen descendants. Last week, the Senate Committee on Indian Affairs held a hearing on the status of Indian freedmen. The five largest tribes in the state are split on complying with treaties signed more than 150 years ago. These treaties required those tribes to change the way they treat descendants of slaves they held until freed at the end of the Civil War. Legal counsel for the Choctaw Nation of Oklahoma says the core of its constitutional identity as a sovereign tribe is being threatened. Cherokee Nation Principal Chief Chuck Hoskin Jr. stated that what is at the center of the freedom issue is examining and honoring treaties. Although these talks are far from being resolved, the hearing marked an important day of dialogue. A search for unmarked graves at a former Canadian residential school is underway. Shawshot First Nation officials say the search for the gravesite at the former Alberni Indian Residential School has begun, and officials also stated that it will impact more than 100 First Nations in British Columbia who had children attending the school. APTN's Lee Wilson has the latest. The chief of Shoshot First Nation says a search of the former residential school near Port Alberni is underway. Chief Wamish says the search is being done by the company GeoScan but it is being led by school survivors and hereditary leadership, according to their ceremonies and protocols. And so the first day they we participated in the ceremony and we moved on to some of the scanning on the next day uh, using GPR and other techniques that they have uh, at various priority areas in the community uh, that have been identified through research or through interviews with survivors. The Alberni Indian Residential School ran from the late 1800s until the 1970s. It was run by the Presbyterian Church, then the United Church, and Indian Affairs. Children from more than 100 First Nations attended the school. Chief Wamish says the search is all about the children. It's really for them. It's really to justify what, what I think they've been saying all along. As children, we grew up and we heard about these stories. And many of uh, you know survivors' children or survivors have always talked about these stories, about the children who didn't make it home for various reasons. Uh, this is going to help solidify what, what they've been saying for a long time. And again, we, we consider it a sacred responsibility to do this and get, help them get the answers. Wamish thinks it is important for the media to keep highlighting the stories of residential schools so survivors know accountability is ongoing. Because that isn't just for the education for non-Indigenous people. 
that's to make sure this story stays alive so that survivors know that it's not just falling off the plate of governments and Canadians, that it's always on their mind that, hey, this happened not so long ago in our history. And we need to educate future generations, not only so it doesn't happen again, but so they always know what happened. This week's activity of the school grounds is the first phase of multiple searches. Lee Wilson, APTN National News, Kitimat. In Nevada, a Yarrington Paiute runner is continuing his journey of healing from the trauma of boarding schools. Ku Stevens will host his second annual Remembrance Run on August 12th through the 14th. He will run approximately 50 miles through rugged terrain, starting from Yarrington Paiute tribal lands to the Stewart Indian Boarding School. Last year, Ku retraced the steps of his great-grandfather Frank Quinn by the running by the path. This year, he is inviting others to run with him on the journey. ICT will cover this journey later this month, and so far, confirmed guests include several tribal leaders, a U.S. Senator, and Olympian Billy Mills. And those are the headlines for the ICT newscast. Coming up, an actress who plays a fan-favorite character, Willie Jack, is ready to visit, and we'll hear more on the Association on American of Indian Affairs. When the Pope traveled to the homelands of the First Nations people last week, a lot was made of the headdress that was given to the gift of the leader of the Catholic Church. One group, which is the largest organization for Indigenous women in Canada, is the Native Women's Association of Canada. And joining us today is Carol McBride, the president of the association. Welcome, President McBride. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So I understand that um, you and your organization um, had were impacted by by the gift that was given to the Pope. Could you touch more on um, what exactly the impact of of that gift is? Um, well, I have my my opinion on that, and um, I know a lot of uh, people across the the country are, are outraged about uh, about that. But my feeling is is that. Uh, everyone has a way of healing and maybe the person that gave the headdress to uh, to um, the pope uh, maybe that was a way that this person um, that was a, a way of healing um, i'm not quite sure i, f I really um, feel that we need to respect everyone's opinion and everyone's way of, of, of healing. So my thoughts are is that if this helped him uh, with his healing and, and on his healing path, so be it. Um, I, but I, I do know a lot of people across the country are uh, outraged. They do feel that this is another part of uh, their culture being given away. Could you touch more on, on your role specifically within um, your, the organization? Uh, well, first of all, <laughs> I've only been in uh, for about not even 10 days. Um, so everything is quite new to me at this point. But um, the re the, some of the reasons why I ran for the presidency was that I think NWAC um, uh, what I'd like to do is to work on the relationships with the Crown, uh, making it a better one. Um, from what I, I see, NWAC has grown um, substantially in, in the last few years. Uh, their, um, their membership is, is quite large. So I want to give NWAC a very strong voice with all levels of government, whether it's federal or provincial, um, on the issues of what, what pertains to women and families uh, across this country. We do have a lot of uh, similar um, issues, uh, but I plan on um, working with the grassroots as well. After all, if you don't understand what's going on, on the, you know, within the grassroots, then what are you what are, what are you there for? Um, the other thing is is that I'm really looking forward to then I'm getting right in 
to uh, to the advocacy of my job um, would be is our strategic planning session that will be coming up within the next few weeks. So that's going to be very interesting. That's going to give me my uh, path on um, on um, you know where do we go from here. So it's going to be a very very interesting uh, for me in the next coming months. And President McBride, many First Nations people are matrilineal. Do you think that the voices of grandmothers and mothers and daughters need to be heard more when it comes to addressing um, the historical trauma of residential schools? Uh, definitely. And I think uh, they're going to play their part. Um, and um, as myself in this, in this role, I'll be able to be a strong voice for them as well. So, um, you know, I hope... Uh, by working with the grassroots, that that uh, voice comes out very strong and clear to whoever has to hear them, whether it's federal or provincial governments. What what will happen next now that the Pope is visited? Do you think that's enough, or do you think that there's more to do um, in regards to healing? Oh my goodness, there is so much. And, and that's where I was a bit uh, disappointed. Well, not only a bit, but um, it was the fact, like, yes, the apology was there. I didn't think it went far enough, but I also feel that uh, there could have been done more in the planning uh, of action on what happens from here on, um, like take for example, uh, I would like to have heard the, him talk about how he plans on, uh, you know, releasing the files that our First Nations and um, uh, the other uh, communities across the country will have access to very important information on their children, on what happened with them. Um, and I think those have to be public. And the other thing is the artifacts that uh, is sitting at the Vatican. I think those have to be released in respect to uh, where they belong. Uh, you know, where um, whether it's the First Nation or Métis community or, or whomever, but those have to be returned. And also, um, you know, the uh, doctrine of, uh, of uh, has to be looked at again and uh, what people, indigenous people want is that, that um, to be rescinded. Anyway, uh, those are a lot uh, of things that I think have to be planned and uh, we, we want to see action on these things. Well, President McBride, thank you so much. Our time is up, but I appreciate you being here. Ojibwe citizen C.C. Hovey is the new Public Affairs and Communications Director for the Association on American Indian Affairs. Founded in 1922, the organization works to change the path of federal policy from assimilation, termination, and allotment to sovereignty, self-determination, and self-sufficiency. She joins us today to talk about her new role, the 100-year history of her organization, as well as its future. Welcome to the show, Cece. Thank you for having me. Of course. So let's just jump right in. You were previously worked at the Strong Hearts Native Helpline. Could you talk more about your role there? Sure. So Strong Hearts Native Helpline, for those who don't know, is a 24-7 domestic dating and sexual violence helpline for Natives by Natives. And it's available by calling or texting 1-844-7-NATIVE or by chatting online at strongheartshelpline.org. I was the communications manager for over two years as they were going through the pandemic and a massive expansion of services. And while I was there, we added services like text and online chat, expanded hours of operation to 24-7, and we added specific sexual violence advocacy as well. And I helped launch all of the public awareness campaigns for each new improvement, as well as I worked with an agency to develop a brand new user-friendly website. And I'm really proud of the work that I was able to accomplish while I was there. 
And now you're at the Association of American Indian Affairs. Could you tell us more about that position? Yeah, so I am really thrilled to be here. Um, I'm honored to be a part of the one this 100-year-old uh, Native organization, which um, is also the oldest nonprofit serving Indian country. And I'm really thrilled to work with an all-Native, all-female executive team. Um, and uh, the association is a membership organization, and we speak with a unified voice from all over the country, both Native and non-Native together, to protect sovereignty, preserve culture, um, educate youth, and build capacity. So in this new role, I'll be helping update and maintain all of our media and communications channels, and hopefully I'll be a guest on your show again soon. <laughs> Do you offer any programs that our audiences might be familiar with? Yes. Um, so one of the ones that you'll probably be hearing a lot about um, in the news coming up um, is we were the original drafters of ICWA or the Indian Child Welfare Act. And so our attorneys worked in state courts to bring back Native children one by one. And through that effort, we developed the language needed for ICWA. Um, today, unfortunately, we are working with many, many Native nations and Native organizations and others to prevent ICWA from being overturned in the U.S. Supreme Court. We also work to ensure appropriate implementation of ICWA through litigation, advocacy, and training. Um, we offer scholarships. We offer undergrad and graduate scholarships for students who wish to obtain a degree and work to um, serve their tribal communities and Indian country as a whole. Uh, we have summer camp grants. We provide small seed grants to tribes and native run organizations for their youth summer camp programs that focus on language and cultural preservation or diabetes ed education and youth uh, health and wellness. And then we also have our native youth justice program where we provide recommendations about improving efforts to find culturally appropriate alternatives to incarceration for native youth and collaborate with tribes. We have a community of practice group of court and other practitioners that work with youth in Indian country to develop best practices and support for tribes um, with youth in trouble. Um, a couple more that I want to touch on. <laughs> we, we are a wide ranging organization, I will say that. Um, and I want to acknowledge that all of these are really complex issues and I've really only touched on, you know, just a little bit of detail on these, but our website is really great about providing um, additional details. So uh, one of the other programs that you can find on our website is Protect the Sacred. We work to protect our relatives, water, land, and sacred places. And then we also do repatriation work. Um, so we are involved with the uh, NAGPRA or the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. Uh, we work on international repatriation. Uh, we work with private collectors and auctions um, to bring those things to light. So that is a lot. <laughs> and if you want any more details on those programs, like I said, please check out our website, indian-affairs.org. Um, or we'd again, be happy to come back on your show and talk about those programs more in depth. And is there anything on the horizon for you um, and the association in general? Yeah, so um, we have our eighth annual repatriation conference coming up on October 11th, 12th, and 13th at the beautiful Firekeepers Casino Resort in New Buffalo. And the theme of the conference this year is reactivating our ancestral connections because we must all act together to reactivate our relationships with one another and our relationships with the past to create a world where diverse native cultures and values are lived, protected and respected. And we're offering scholarships to attend that conference. Um, so scholarships are for those who need it uh, the most and they will be prioritized for elders over 65, students in your university or college, tribal spiritual leaders, tribal repatriation staff, or staff from an institution working on repatriation um, that has a budget below $250,000. we are accepting applications now until August 15th, right on our website, and all of the conference information, including registration, hotel information, and most importantly, that scholarship ad application are available on our website at indian-affairs.org. After that, the um, event that I'm really excited about, because it's the first one ever, uh, coming up on December 3rd as our 100-year celebration, as one of our 100-year celebration events, uh, we'll be hosting the first annual National Tribal Museums Day. 
Um, and that's to bring attention to our diverse nations, stimulate tourism, and grow tribal economies. And Tribal Museums Day will also support the vision and mission of each of our tribal museums by re-educating the public that our diverse nations are primary experts of indigenous histories, knowledge, arts, and cultures. Participation is free for tribal museums and cultural centers, and this grassroots event will be supported by this, us, the association, and we're asking tribal uh, museums and cultural centers to provide free admission for the public on this special day. And the museums will also have special exhibits, gift shop discounts, holiday markets, cultural demonstrations, and that sort of thing. Um, and you can follow along on all of our social media for this nationwide event. Um, we're on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, YouTube, and TikTok now. Um, and you can just find us by searching Association ugh, Association on American Indian Affairs. Well, Cece, that was all the time that we had today, but thank, thank you, you for joining us. The second season of Reservation Dogs is nearly upon us. ICT's editor Jordan Bennett Begay asked breakout star Paulina Alexis how the year went for her following the show's release. It's been great, man. I've just been home. I'm doing the same thing this year. I'm going to play hockey. It's my last, my last year. Well, if I register before I turn 22, then, and then I can play. But it's my last year junior, and I'm playing junior A this year, probably with Edmonton Wolves. And then when it comes to like tournament season, I'll be coaching again, be coaching all the nieces and nephews and stuff. And oh, wow, that'd be fun. Yeah. Award shows coming up, press is coming up, it's about to get busy again. Along with acting, Alexis has lots of other interests, including playing competitive hockey. Well, I started when I was like four. My mom and dad put me on skates when I was four. And then we moved to the res, so I couldn't really play as much. Um, couldn't really afford it. So like, I I didn't play uh, anything till like I was like nine. Then I like would like, we'd be going on my brother's games and like all my cousin's games. And then I'd be like, mom, I wanna play hockey. And I'm just the only girl. And my mom put me back into it when I was like nine. I played with boys. And then I stopped playing for like two years and then I got back into it when I was 12. And yeah, I've always been in love with hockey like ever since I was a kid. Like um, I made my, I remember I made my dad uh, pick up a net on the side of the road. Like someone in the res, like someone just threw a net in the ditch. And like, I, want, I, was, I remember I was asking my dad for a net for the longest time and he picked it up for me. And we slapped it in the back. We just tied all those holes together in the net. And it was just like brand new. And then I learned on that. And like I just grinded it in my basement for like a year. I got like some cheap Bayou Village rollerblades for like five bucks. And then I would just rollerblade and shoot out my cheap net. And then like by the next year, I was like the best on my team. And if you can't find her on the rink, Paulina is probably training for horse relay races. I'm training for it right now. I want, I really want to race one day. But like every year I tried to race, Res Dogs like cut off my training season so I couldn't even race. Like literally right when training season starts, they'd fly me out to Oklahoma to go shoot Res Dogs. And I'd be like, damn, I can't race this year. And then like I'd have to come home and just grind so I could try to race. I didn't get to race last year, but this year hopefully I can race before summer's over, before I turn 22. The actress's love for horses goes beyond racing. Alexis talks about how taking care of the animals can help to heal her people. That's another one of my dreams that I have is to race because I'm the only rider from my reserve right now. And I really want to bring horses back to like our people and because like our youth in my risk and like in Canada, like they struggle with a lot of addictions, but like horses, they really like, um, they keep you busy and they give you like a responsibility and like a purpose. And like, I think that that will really help our youth at the same time too. Cause like, I always wanted fucking horses when I was a kid, but like we never had nowhere to put them or anything. So like, that's what I want to do. I want to like build like 
a barn and track on our reserve so like kids can start having horses there and taking care of them like see them riding every day. And although she couldn't share a whole lot about the next season, she did say how it felt to return to the Res Dog set. It felt so good to see everyone again, but then like it felt like we once we were once we got all together, it like felt like we haven't even like left each other. Like the vibes were just up there again. And it was like we just seen them like yesterday. And like what I like a lesson I think I learned is especially with rice dogs I did I don't really like to rehearse so that makes sense like I like um doing everything as natural as I can and like on the spot I don't know if you can notice it but um yeah they'd be rehearsing a couple times and I'd be like I can't really rehearse that much because like most of my lines are improv right I have to like feel it on the spot and like do it that way so that's like one of the lessons I took that I realized when I was doing season two. You can stream the new season of Reservation Dogs on Hulu starting August 3rd. And that's a slice of our Indigenous world. For all the latest visit ictnews.org. From all of us in the newsroom stay safe my relatives. Sometimes you got to take a stand just because you know you can't oh, you got to run you got to run This program is made possible by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, a private corporation funded by the American people.